talk to you about a legal principle today, uh, the principles of contracts. And um, I couldn't help but keep recalling in my head as I was driving down here from Kentucky, um, I had an interesting interchange with my pastor on Sunday morning. I was the lay reader. And um, for those of you who are liturgical, who go to liturgical churches, um, the reading uh, for Sunday was out of Genesis. And it was the story of uh, God talking to Abraham about Sarah conceiving. Now, the part they left off, what I read was that once God said that, Abraham fell on the desert floor and started to laugh because his wife was nearly 100 years old. And so as I was standing up there kind of going through it before the service started, the, uh, this uh, minister of ours who I adore came up and I said, um, you know, Martin, there's something about this passage that uh, you ought to know about. And he thought that I was about to say something profound in my faith or something, okay? I said, from this passage, we get the fertile octogenarian exception to the rule against perpetuities. <laughs> and with that, his, the mouth went open, you know, like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, well, anyway, we can talk about the rule against perpetuities later. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about compacts and contracts. And, and by the way, the title of this talk is The Compact Theory. Well, I mean, it's really not a theory. I mean, we're talking about rules of law here. And let me just kind of go through a little bit of the background. and and then the rules themselves. And then, folks, you can make up your mind. Is the, con is the Constitution of the United States a contract, or is it not? And again, I'll, I'll help you come to a decision, but um, um, I'll let you make up your mind. Let's start, for instance, with uh, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, just as a start, in that those are the ones that um, uh, where state uh, legislatures, states themselves, first brought this uh, concept up in writing. Many understood it who were framers of the Constitution, but this is where it comes out in writing. And we start with the Kentucky Resolution uh, of uh, uh, November 10, 1798, signed by Governor James Garrod. Um, its author is Thomas Jefferson. Um, the one who introduces it into the Kentucky legislature was John Breckinridge, who is buried in our hometown cemetery, the grandfather of General John C. Breckinridge. Um, he became Thomas Jefferson's attorney general and was the defender of the Louisiana Purchase. On his tombstone, it reads John Breckinridge, born Stanton, Virginia, uh, author. Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. I mean, that's what the family thought of him. And um, in fact, even John C. Breckinridge remembered his grandmother, the widow, taking him out as a young boy to Cabellsdale Cemetery, where John Breckinridge was buried originally, sitting him down on the flat stone uh, over the grave and telling young John C. Breckinridge uh, that his, uh, her husband, his grandfather, uh, received the Kentucky Resolutions uh, second-handed through uh, Thomas Jefferson, and that he edited it and then introduced it, argued in favor of it, only one dissenting vote in the entire General Assembly of Kentucky, uh, and it was passed. You can see why his grandson becomes the state's rights Democrat candidate for the presidency in 1860. Well, anyway, this, uh, this resolution, um, uh, it, it, I'll go through just a little bit of it, read just a tiny bit of it, but essentially what it does is set up the fact that the Constitution is a compact. 
and that there are certain things that the states agreed to, there are certain things they agreed not to do, and there are certain things they gave the federal government the power to do, and that when, it is, when those powers are transgressed, then the states have a duty to act. And it then says to this compact, each state acceded as a state and is an integral party. It's co-states forming as to itself the other party. Now, from there, once it sets up that it's a contract, compact, contract, it then says that the government created by this compact was not made the exclusive or final judge of the extent of the powers delegated to itself, since that would have made its decision and not the Constitution the measure of its powers, but that as in all other cases of compact among parties having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself uh, of the infractions as well as the mode of redress. Isn't that clear? I mean, if you're a party to a contract, don't you have a say in how it's administered? The reason the compact theory is critical in constitutional analysis is that if, you, if a state is a party to an instrument, then it does have certain power to administer that to which it agreed. Now, the Virginia Resolution sets it up just as magnificently, frankly. This is drafted by James Madison, as you heard, and introduced into the uh, House of Delegates by John Taylor of Caroline, uh, probably cousins. <laughs> These guys were all cousins in Virginia and Kentucky. Um, they, they just come out of the woodwork and from under the rocks everywhere. Um, uh, Kentucky's new license plate is going to be uh, three million people, 13 last names. Um, uh, the, the, the Virginia um, uh, 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 House of Delegates and um, uh, uh, enacted the Virginia Resolution on December 21, 1798, and here's, here's its brief passage out of its language, that this assembly doth explicitly and peremptorily declare that its views, and it views the powers of the federal government as resulting from the compact to which the states are parties. As limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument, constituting that compact as no further valid than they are authorized by the grants enumerated in that compact. And that in the case of a deliberate, listen to this, a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the compact, the states who are parties thereto have the right and are duty bound to interpose for the arresting of the evil. They're duty bound. They have a right, as parties, they have a right and uh, to interpose and they're duty bound to do it. Those are the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Um, they're phenomenal in what they say. They are, um, in fact, truthful in the law they espouse. And let me uh, kind of go through a little bit of that with you for fun. Um, uh, what is a compact? Um, well, I, fiddling around with this, I came across a great definition of a compact written by none other than Justice Joseph Story. Story, of course, is from Massachusetts. Um, and. Um, I can probably forgive him for that. Um, but he, he became a meddler, to be honest. He, he's the one to whom Daniel Webster, who would not do his homework, would go to and ask him, how do you want me to say this in response to John C. Calhoun? And um, it would be Joseph Story's 
deal that Webster would spew out on the Senate floor. But here's, here's, here's Joseph Story's definition in his treatise on the Constitution. He says, a compact is a contract between parties which creates obligations and rights capable of being enforced and contemplated as such between the parties in their distinct and independent characters. So it's, it's a contract between parties which creates obligations and rights that they all have contemplated would be capable of being enforced. Uh, is that simple? Is it true? Yes, that's the law of contracts, it's the law of compacts. Um, what is a, some simple definitions of a contract in the law? Well, the simplest one can find is it's a promissory agreement between two or more persons that creates, modifies, or destroys legal relationships. Creates, modifies, or destroys. Agreement between two parties. You can have a contract to undo something. You can have a contract to do something. Uh, you can have a contract that changes what you wanted to do originally. Those are all contracts. Another great definition is an agreement creating an obligation in which there must be competent parties, a, a subject matter that's discernible, a legal consideration, mutuality of agreement, mutuality of obligation, and the agreement must not be so vague that you can't determine what the hell you're talking about. Now, go through each one of these. Um, an agreement creating an obligation. Well, uh, let's say uh, you and I agree to a purchase sale agreement. I'm going to sell you some goods and you're going to buy them. Um, we entered into an agreement to do that. Does it create an obligation? Yeah, it does. He, his, he's going to pay me. I may give him the agreement, the stuff, but I mean, no, I'm obligated to give him the stuff. You're obligated to give me the money. Contract? It's a simple, simple contract. Sure. Two or more competent parties. I'm not going to talk about myself, but I assume you're competent to enter into the agreement, right? Uh, two competent parties to do it. Uh, a clearly discernible subject matter. I'm going to sell. You're going to buy. You know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. Legal consideration. Money. He agrees to pay X dollars from my widget, which we agree is worth the money. Um, so we both have got consideration. I'm giving up something. He's giving up something. Uh, there's mutuality. Well, I've just expressed the mutuality. He's going to give up something. I'm going to give up something of comparable value to effectuate the agreement. And a mutuality of obligation. We both have obligations. We have a contract, right? It's that simple. Um, there's a, to put, a, put a twist to this that's not a big twist, but let's say that you and you and you, Bob, uh, and me enter into an agreement to create a widget company. Now, lawyers do this all the time, don't we? We, uh, parties come in, they say, I want to create a corporation to make whatever. Widgets again. And, um, uh, each one of us, Mr. Lawyer, want to uh, give up so much money uh, in exchange for stock in the company that we create. Okay? So you just draft an agreement. Uh, do we have obligations created? Yeah, we do. Each one of them have an obligation to give in so much money to create an organization in which they get stock back that they think will be of comparable and hopefully bigger value as time goes by, right? Um, comp uh, we have competent parties. We have four of us creating a third entity. Is the third entity, by the way, a party? No, it's not. It's the creature of this, right? Uh, we have a discernible subject matter. Um, we have legal consideration. Our money in exchange for the stock 
that we think is going to take off and do us well? Do we have mutuality of agreement and mutuality of obligation? You bet we do. You all see that? It's a subscription agreement. Uh, agreement to create a company and subscribe to stock. Um, well, let's take that example, by the way. Um, on September 17, uh, 1787 in Philadelphia, uh, 12 of the 13 states signed off on an agreement in which they said uh, that they gave the unanimous consent of the states present um, to a constitution that um, they had drafted. Took them all summer long. Rhode Island, by the way, was not present. Um, Rhode Island would be the last state to ratify the Constitution, and in fact, they brought economic sanctions against the state until they did. Um, maybe we should all look to Rhode Island with, uh, with a, uh, a genuflet in that direction or something. Um, but uh, um, it, it, no matter how many states were, how many, how many delegates from each state were in that convention in Philadelphia, each state had one vote. So at the end of the Constitution, you have all the names of the states. And then the acknowledgment that of those present, the unanimous decision of those states agreed to send this document to the states for ratification. Okay. Um, then if you just flip the page, a couple of pages over to Article 7, it reads this, the ratification conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this constitution between the states so ratifying this. That's the text of the constitution says that it'll be a constitution between the states so ratifying the same. Is that clear? Is there any dispute as to what the framers intended in that statement? You go to Article 4 about amending the Constitution. And what does it say? about how an amendment is approved. What well, it's the legislatures of three-fourths of the states. The legislatures, it reads. And if it's a convention, it's two the legislatures of two-thirds of the states. Doesn't say the people. The legislatures of the states amended. I mean, you, you, you literally rest your case at that state on this issue. Is it a compact? Is it a contract? Let's take a look like we did with our little, our little agreement. Um, did it have competent parties, this so-called constitution? Well, there were, there were 12 of them that agreed by states, not by delegates, by states, to agree to send it to ratification. So we had, um, you had in the beginning, uh, 12 competent parties uh, was there a common subject matter? Yeah, there was. Um, it was to create this third entity, just like our widget company, right? Uh, was there legal consideration? You bet. Each state gave up some sovereignty, right? Uh, in exchange for some protection, common defense mostly. So there's, there's, there's legal consideration here. Um, was there mutuality of agreement? Yeah, all unanimous. It says unanimous, the bottom of the Constitution. 
Um, and was there mutuality of obligation? Yeah, they all agreed to be bound to do what that document said. Was there, is that a contract? <laughs> if it isn't, I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> I don't know what the hell it is. Um, but let me, let me kind of throw this one wrench into this, the wrench that just aggravates the living hell out of me. And that's John Marshall, Thomas Jefferson's other cousin, by the way. Um, here you have um, a case in 1819 brought before the Supreme Court of the United States um, known as McCulloch against Maryland. All of us have read it, I mean, in college or law school or whatever. And there's a, simply the state of Maryland uh, sought to tax the hated Bank of the United States. And um, uh, the state of Maryland uh, was, was, was sued by the Bank of the United States claiming that the tax was unconstitutional, that they didn't, the state didn't have the power to tax uh, a creature of the federal government uh, that was enacted properly and constitutionally. And um, uh, it reached the Supreme Court of the United States on a writ of error. And um, uh, John Marshall and that court could have resolved this case simply by saying, okay, under the powers of Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, Congress had the power to create a bank. It has the power to coin money, uh, and it's necessary and proper that its powers include the power to create a bank. He could have said that, and, and frankly, he did, but he didn't want to stop there. He could have also said that because Congress did that, it is under the Constitution the supreme law of the land, and he did say that. But he didn't want to stop there. Instead, uh, this is 1819. We have seen the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. We've seen the revolution of 1800, the election of Thomas Jefferson. And we've seen the Hartford Convention, where at least three states in New England sought to secede from the Union because of the embargo in the War of 1812. Oh, when it comes to their commercial interests up there, don't, 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 don't dare touch that. Uh, we, can, we can touch your society down here from there, from there boy, but don't you dare touch our commercial interests. So um, anyway, here, here is Marshall, uh, an arch federalist. Uh, I remember, uh, it, it, remember, remember reading where uh, a letter of Thomas Jefferson's in 1799, John Marshall's family, you know, all moved to Kentucky. His mother and father are buried in Mason County, Kentucky, where his father put over his mother's tomb, put on her mother's, his mother's tombstone, um, good but not great, uh, oh, uh, relatively good looking but not ornamental. <laughs> now, that's right outside the house that Thomas Marshall built. And there's the grave, and I mean, his fifth great-grandson was a lawyer friend of mine who owned the place and used it as their getaway home up in Washington County, Washington, Kentucky, in Mason County. But I mean, it's just a, if that's the father, what do you think the kid's like? I mean, uh, um, anyway, here, here, here is Marshall. Now, remember what I just went through with all the, what is a contract? Part in parties, mutuality of obligation, consideration, all this stuff. And, and, pay, and, and think particularly of Article 7, where ratification by nine states shall make this a constitution between the states so ratifying. That's the text of the constitution. Here's Marshall. And he's responding now to the counsel for the state of Maryland who raises the specter of the resolutions of 98, okay? Marshall, it would be difficult to sustain such a proposition. The convention which framed the Constitution was indeed elected by state legislatures. 
But the instrument, when it came from their hands, was a mere proposal, without obligation or pretensions to it. It was reported to the, to the then existing Congress of the United States with a request that it might be submitted to a convention of the delegates chosen in each state by the people thereof under the recommendation of its legislature for their assent and ratification. She's already started to twist this. It was sent to the people, he says. Okay. This mode of proceeding was adopted and by convention, by Congress, and by the state legislatures, the instrument was submitted to the people. They acted upon it in the only manner in which they can act safely, effectively, and wisely on such a subject by assembling in convention. It is true they assembled in their several states. And where else would they have assembled? No political dreamer was ever wild enough to think of breaking down the lines which separate the states and of compounding the American people into one common mass. Oh. Of consequence, when they act, they act in their states. But the measures they adopt do not, on that account, cease to be the measures of the people themselves or become the measures of the state governments. The government of the union then is emphatically and truly a government of the people in form and in substance it emanates from them. Its powers are granted by them and are to be exercised directly on them and for their benefit. By the way, that's where Lincoln got his, his section of the Gettysburg Address of by and for the people was from McCulloch against Maryland. Um, Think of that. Look at what he just did. What he did, he took the preamble, Marshall, and said, um, this is we the people. So um, this is not a government created by the states. It's created by the people. Is it? What do we do with preambles? Are preambles the law? How many of you entered into a contract that has a whereas clause at the top? Whereas this, whereas that, now therefore, there's your contract underneath. Um, do we enforce the whereas clauses? Um, no, we don't. I found a, this is, this, is, this is universal among state courts. Um, here's one uh, from the Court of Appeals of Kentucky. Um, it says, a whereas clause of a contract is but an introductory or prefacatory statement, meaning considering that or that being the case, and is not an essential part of the operating portions of the contract. So it's not, a, it's not, a, not an essential part of the text. Those are the operating portions of the contract. And then an Oregon court said this about preambles. A preamble is not an essential part of an act, and neither enlarges nor confers powers. And of course, that is the law in every state in the union. And it is the law for purposes of contracts entered into by the United States. Preambles mean nothing. Preambles to statutes mean nothing. Whereas clauses in contracts mean nothing. It's what's in the text that matters. And what's in the text? When nine states ratify this Constitution, it shall be a Constitution between the states so ratified. It's Marshall that literally broke what was accepted law for hundreds and hundreds of years. And by the way, the rule against perpetuities, it, it originates probably in the 17th century in England. The law of contracts begins before Henry II. I mean, it's, the, it's among the oldest uh, concepts in the law we have are those that emanate from contracts. What are they? How are they enforced? And yet he would be so disingenuous as to reach back and say, I'm going to enforce the preamble. And folks, that's where it all began.
It's where it all began. Now, I only have a minute or two left. Um, I have to say that um, educating people um, in things of this nature are critical to undoing things that we have seen before, for sure. Uh, political action is critical in this country. Um, but you know, I also have uh, good feelings in spite of all the dismal things going on out there. And that is that there is movement in this country uh, and in the world uh, to throw off the shackles of bigness. There really is. And you're seeing people far more interested in their home governance than they are in Congress. I can't help but believe the crowds we're seeing, uh, frankly, generated by Mr. Trump are, are an example of people who are sick and tired of this stuff. So in a word of encouragement, and, and by the way, you're going to hear later a talk about how the state courts are so much better than federal courts and enforce. I was saying that at breakfast this morning, that uh, you know, in my experience going through federal courts, state courts, at least in at least 10, 15 different states over my career of 43 years, uh, state courts are far better, are more willing to uh, 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 examine constitutional issues. Uh, and I think it's because those guys are elected. And they're responsible. And um, somehow or another, um, we've got to generate and regenerate within the states, within your own state, to make this change happen. But let me assure you this. There's no theory about this. The Constitution of the United States is a contract between the states that ratified it. It's no theory. That is it, and that's the text. Thank you.